Welcome everyone, happy Friday and happy end of the semester. Thank you so much for joining, particularly at this time. Um, I see, so the uh, wastewater team, you would like to go first. Is that okay with the resilient CLT team? Okay. Um, then without further ado, I'll just let the teams take it from here. Um, we're pretty flexible on the amount of time that you take for your presentation because we're only two teams. So just try to keep it to somewhere around a half an hour if you can. Um, and then we'll have some time for discussion and feedback from uh, Kyle, Hillary, and Michael. Thank you so much. Take it away, team. Thank you, Catherine. So tonight we are presenting our project titled Toward a New Paradigm, Implementing Reimagined Coastal Wastewater Infrastructure. We are the third capstone group at City College looking at the Jamaica Bay 26 Ward Wastewater Resource Recovery Facility as a site for next generation infrastructure, incorporating advanced circular economy technologies with community benefits. Our group is specifically looking at removing barriers to the implementation of the vision developed by our preceding capstone team and supported by the site assessment of the first team. To quickly contextualize this project, we have to mention the timeliness of an upgrade to a wastewater resource recovery facility. The proposed upgrade to the site we're going to introduce you to on the next slide is worthy of consideration because we're at a pivotal moment in our country where our infrastructure has reached the end of its lifespan. We have an opportunity to reimagine what wastewater infrastructure can look like, who and to what degree of a sustainable future it can serve, and leverage it as a once in a generation investment in jobs, health and infrastructure and social resilience as our climate changes and threats to these elements increase. Federal, state and New York City level policies speak to these goals, the closed loop, triple bottom line vision. In this presentation, we will share how and why a closed loop wastewater recovery facility, public campus immediately integrated in its environs can benefit surrounding communities and national environment and relieve food, water, and energy resource burden on its surrounding communities. We'll share a cost estimate for this upgrade and then dig into specific barriers we've identified and paths to overcome such barriers to encourage adoption of what is considered a mega project, a project that requires multiple agencies collaborate, a lot of money and community considerations. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah. With a, as mentioned before, we're the third group to work on this project. Team A did a site assessment, Team B developed a vision, and this vision was a mega project with various components that in integrate the community with the wastewater treatment plant. This video I'm about to show you is of the 26th ward with the 26th the Star City community in the background, incorporating the proposed upgrades the previous teams developed. It includes an outdoor food market to tackle food insecurity in the community, a solar farm that will make the plants net zero or net positive in the future, a pedestrian walkway to allow access to the coast with a berm, with a berm and floating wetland system that will provide flood protection. Wastewater treatment plants will be upgraded to have public arts that will attract more people to the coast and will add co-digesters that mix food waste with sewage waste to provide energy and nutrients for the other components in this project. The Star City community will get community operated facilities, a restaurant slash brewery, and an eco bridge that will allow easier travel to the mall nearby. Oh, why is it still playing? So in thinking about the components that define this project, we determined that the convergence of each project component serves to address topics such as renewable energy, coastal resiliency, community resiliency, urban agriculture, and waste management. So in addition to the flyover video you saw, we also developed a conceptual cost estimate for this project by breaking it up by the components you just saw and extrapolating the cost based on multiple case studies that we found. The general takeoff table was calculate what happened to the table. Okay, I don't know what happened. Um, 
depth takeoff table was calculated based on square footage and a table on the right showing a small sample of the case studies used and the extrapolated costs based on sizes of the plans and based on each parameter or component. To extrapolate based on size, we used a simple ratio between the wastewater treatment plant sizes. And for the parameter cost, we ran a regression analysis, which involved graphs like this that could be used to predict component costs. Obviously, it's not perfect or as accurate as it can be. There's a lot of assumptions we made, which you can read about in the paper, but it was a good exercise in understanding the challenges that go into cost estimating a large project like this, such as figuring out which variables affect the cost. And the total cost of the project that we calculated with a 30% contingency or safety factor added is about 2 billion US dollars over 20 years. Now funding a project of this magnitude and scale is beyond the public agency's scope of work and spending budget and will require interagency cooperation mixed with private dollars. It's also important to note that this project will not be built all at once and will be broken into phases based on components. Jeremy, you muted. Sorry, so what are we doing? We're investigating and addressing potential barriers and paths to the implementation of Team B's water resource recovery urban coastal proposal using three topics to outline and guide our research. The three topics include planning and institutional, finance and economic, and community engagement and opposition. So the 26 Ward Water Resource Recovery Facility is located at the northeastern part of Jamaica Bay in direct proximity to two bodies of water, which include Hendricks Creek to the east and Fresh Creek Nature Preserve to the west. It's an industrial site in direct proximity to the Jamaica Bay estuary and faces climate challenges such as flooding, sea level rise, and poor water quality. So who are the potential stakeholders that might be involved in a mega project such as this? So we've determined that New York City agencies and sectors that include business, civic services, culture and recreation, environment, housing and development, as well as the community stakeholders and sectors, which include agriculture, environmental justice, nonprofit organizations, educational institutions, community boards with community members, religious institutions, and housing and development. Why? Why are we investigating and addressing barriers and paths to the implementation of this mega project? So we are investigating ways to align public and private agencies and organizations with project components and tessellate each piece with one another to ultimately, one, encourage interagency coordination by unifying goals and by connecting government stakeholders to elements of the project Two, we're trying to merge public and private assets to develop funding and financing mechanisms for the mega project. And three, we're ultimately trying to promote community health, wealth, and social capital through uh, participatory planning processes and a series of community-centered project components. So we have to ask, you know, how, how did we go about formulating a strategy for investigating the ways in which we can implement this mega project? So we created a conceptual map to visually track our thought processes as well as make connections between ideas. By starting with a central research question, which is what are the ways in which we create a synergy or hybridization between circular economy technologies and water resource recovery infrastructure while providing community benefits such as health, wealth, and social resilience? Through this, we're able to create a frame into which potential solutions would fall. From there, we decided that one way of addressing the central question was to think which elements might prevent the realization of the mega project. And in that conceptual methodology, baked into the question was a solution to guide our research. We needed to think about barriers to the implementation of the mega project and consider potential paths. So moving forward, we took the idea of barriers and distilled it into three main topics in order to help guide our research. From there, we broke down each topic into subtopics which we would use, then use to dissolve into potential subtopics or potential paths to implementation. So what are the planning and institutional barriers? 
So one is a linear mindset across public and private sectors in which resources now are viewed as abundant. Two would be an imbalanced zoning landscape at the community level. Three would be fragmented planning mandates that increase difficulty for creating things like equity and inclusion within land use and budget planning frameworks. Four would be a lack of interagency coordination, creating redundancies and limitations for New York City to achieve uh, citywide goals. Five would be potentially inadequate proactive planning for communities due to out, somewhat outdated zoning documents. Six would be lack of policy levers to address challenges, uh, which are linear economic challenges in their nature. And seven would be an inadequate assessment of capital needs at the community level. So mirroring the potential barriers are the potential pathways. So one would be create a circular economy mindset across public and private sectors. Two would be to analyze the sort of exclusionary policies that exist within New York City zoning uh, resolution frameworks. Three would be to formulate a long-term comprehensive planning framework. Four would be to develop interagency coordination strategies. Five would be create a vision for supporting investments and growth across neighborhoods. Six, to develop policy levers for the transition to a circular economy. And seven would be to refine what's known as the asset information management system report to reflect infrastructure needs at the community level. And to understand what that is, the report itself itemizes planned spending at the asset and product level. So paying for this mega project and other mega projects like this is going to require getting over the current budgeting process that is inefficient and competitive and a limited funding framework needed to help guide that budgeting. There's also a lack of legislation that enables public-private partnerships, particularly in New York, which would bring private financing into these projects and would additionally come with the challenge of finding and creating the right partnerships for the project. There are also challenges defining the scope of work because there are so many different components involved with mega projects like this. Lastly, this typically over optimistic cost estimation calculations, which leads to an underestimation in your costs. All of these barriers add to larger projected costs than anticipated, which means these projects will run out of money before it's even started. Big Dig was a major highway infrastructure project in Boston. And even though it isn't a wastewater treatment plant, it's a good example of how all these barriers can lead to a substantial increase in the cost for a large infrastructure project. And you can see from the graph that the projected cost for the project started at 2 billion and rose to just 5 billion, while the actual cost ended up over $14 billion. There were a few major topics that we looked at as we to finance and fund these projects, mega projects, which include public funding, private financing, and how to combine the two. Public funding opportunities may come in the form of bonds that target specific projects to ensure a specific outcome, such as a green bond that are meant to ensure projects that will have a positive impact on the environment. State revolving funds are loaned with below market interest, which, which also makes it appealing for private entities to become involved. And these are also getting additional funding with Biden's infrastructure plan. Infrastructure grant programs fund projects that benefit specific parts of the population, such as the FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, which helps fund coastal resiliency projects, such as the proposed project. Um, and lastly, new creative taxes that incentivize the taxpayer to make environmentally friendly decisions through something like a tar carbon tax or vehicle tax, which can help finance more sustainable fuels, and energy, Majority of the public funding was primarily coming from the state and local government, as shown from the graph, but with Biden's trillion dollar infrastructure bill, federal funding now is getting a huge boost. In terms of private financing, an insurance surcharge is useful for those that are impacted from flooding because the insurance money can then go to flooding, funding coastal protection, like a floating wetland system or a berm. Revenue from existing properties can add additional revenue for the mega project. For example, a private business or home 
that wants to protect their property from flooding or any climate related disaster can simply buy into that project. Even though, and additionally, even though New York does not have public private partnership legislation, doesn't mean it won't be effective at financing large infrastructure projects like the proposed upgrade. Case studies across the United States prove that it's highly effective at reducing project costs and bringing in millions of dollars in revenue for any city. The Power Purchase Agreement, which is a specific type of PPP related to energy generation, can bring in additional revenue to fund parts of the project and save money on energy costs. Now, this table shows some of the case studies we looked at for public-private partnerships related to the proposed 26 ward upgrade uh, and other information regarding funding. And as you'll notice, a lot of these case studies use both private and public funding. Um, and for banker projects like this, the 26 ward upgrade, having one local entity, such as a local nonprofit mm -hmm. organization, can bring in both the public and private sector together while keeping the community engaged. Now, these multifaceted projects do not solely rely on either public or private funds. And we should look to find ways to combine both. By drawing cash flow models, we can show how these funds can work together. And you can do that by breaking down the project into its components and then piece together how each part of, part of the project could be funded as plugins into the project. Take, for example, the code I just 26 word could, could apply for a clean water state revolving fund with a private entity and secure partial funds for the code digester with a low interest rate. It can then sign a public private partnership, such as a design build operate contract that will ensure that the code digester is fully functional and profitable to help pay back the loan. In addition, food waste tipping fees collected for the code digester can provide additional revenue and that same private company and also sell the biosolids product to cover operation and maintenance costs, while the energy created can add additional revenue through a power purchase agreement to cover any additional OM costs. And any leftover revenue that's generated can go to funding other parts of the project, like the public arts display. Naturally, opposition to an upgrade is to be expected. We need only look at historic injustices like those resulting from Harlem's North River Sewage Treatment Plant or the decades of contamination of Jamaica Bay itself since the Industrial Revolution. Upgrades to wastewater recovery facilities in the area and three decades later, local environmental groups are still contending with nitrogen and ammonia discharges into the bay. And most recently in 2011, community groups fought against the extension of JFK airport runways out into the bay that would have destroyed hundreds of acres of critical habitat refuge. Meanwhile, Team A assessed that everyday residents surrounding the 26 ward plan are unaware of their position on the coast and the dangers that come with that, especially in a warming climate. So not only is it reasonable to expect that local residents would ask, why would we want this? We could expect residents to actively oppose the upgrade because they think of it as a burden in their backyard, that it's not a resource to them, despite it being just that, and once upgraded with components that will directly serve their needs and desires. That said, community improvements also instill, for good reason, the fear of gentrification. The second barrier we've chosen to highlight is that of engagement. Participatory planning, meant to produce the most inclusive planning process possible, is orthodox in urban planning today, but it too often fails. First, lack of acknowledgement of previous planning injustices sets a tone for opposition that is usually hard to dismantle, hence our first community barrier. Then there are difficulties re recruiting stakeholders and sustaining involvement. Fatigue can quickly set in due to the length of the process and because feedback is not always incorporated. And finally, varying degrees of participation power can lead to issues with government accountability if the, pro the framework for the participatory planning process is weak. So how do we move beyond opposition to a place of actually being open to and showing up to planning sessions in sustained fashion? By moving beyond traditional pathways to stimulate interest and educate local residents about the issues the wastewater recovery facility integrates, we can engage stakeholders and mitigate opposition in the short and long-term life of the project upgrade. Through reframing the relevance of the project to the community, shifting the narrative to relay the connection between community and infrastructure, a process we refer to as community consciousness raising, we can ensure the communities come to participatory planning with newfound open-mindedness and an understanding as to how the upgrade will benefit them while precluding gentrification. 
The tool we've chosen to focus on to accomplish this is art and culture. Art and culture workshops, events, and public art installations, including interactive art, have been shown to increase civic trust and speak a common language that's less didactic and allows for social bonds to grow while learning new concepts and ideas, the design of the plant upgrade embeds. Before announcing any formal plans to upgrade the plant, we've suggested a suite of workshops and public art that reframe the connection between people and the wastewater recovery facility and educate on the issues the plan integrates or mitigates. Many of these are relevant to the pressing issues identified by Community Board 5, which represents the neighborhoods surrounding the plant, healthcare services, land use trends, trash removal and cleanliness, educational attainment, unemployment, crime rate, poverty, and lack of cultural facilities and programs. Um, some of those workshops, some of those include workshops and events around food, lifestyle and urban agriculture, composting, Shirley Chisholm's activism, green finance, and art making in spaces generally perceived as unsafe. That package in our final deliverable also contains a list of local, regional, and national artists and or art organizations that can serve as partners or collaborators in workshops or events, as well as experts in social, environmental, and economic subject matter during the participatory planning process. The second phase in the community path would then be participatory planning. This is a more formal process that follows a framework for achieving final approval on the design. As the, the previous slide suggests, participatory planning is both a barrier and a path in that a flimsy framework can result in fatigue and difficulties with stakeholder identification and, sustainable and sustained involvement. With this in mind, deploying innovative and creative tools that increase access like internet forums, virtual town halls, and developing a community bill of rights have been shown to make the process more inclusive. There are many tools that stimulate community interest and increase participation. Some of those creative established tools that fit into this project like gamification are built into our suggested framework that you'll see on the next slide. In the bottom left photo, you'll see a community screening of a soccer game as part of efforts to make alleys in Seattle safe again. This is the same alley where parties were thrown throughout the process. Preclusions to gentrification such as community benefits agreements or community land trust should also be considered, though these tools, especially CBAs, have their own issues we discuss in our full report, like issues with accountability and timeframe. The issue of gentrification can be its own capstone, and some of the professional practitioners we interviewed during our research phase did not have answers to this question. That said, we cannot leave communities historically marginalized to not reap the benefits of next generation infrastructure. Significant investment in affordable housing to prevent displacement, possibly done through CBAs or CLTs. This could also be accomplished by tying energy equity to the local affordable housing via the microgrid in the design or community solar tied to a net positive solar farm in the design. These are all starting points to present to the community. Further analysis of the gentrification issue in this particular context will be needed and dialogue with community-based organizations like the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation which strives to increase affordable housing are critical. Ultimately, participatory planning strengthens the quality and comprehensiveness of the planning process. At the same time, stakeholder interest and social capital are built as stakeholders come to own a place and invest their own time and energy into a future site that they'll actually use, that they'll actually promote, and they'll be better stewards of the upgraded site once it's complete. How are we doing on time? All good. Okay. Um, both of these solutions, a period of reframing followed by a formal participatory planning process need to keep in mind the use of varied channels of communication. Public art brings attention to this in its serendipitous encounters with community members on streets and laundromats, et cetera. Nevertheless, if neighbors, do not know about the education initiative seeded by the arts and culture reframing events and workshops or stakeholder recruitment at the start of the participatory planning process, these solutions are flawed from the start. Engagement captures the journey from introductory curiosity peaking, that's that first circle that you're looking at on the left, to planting seeds that inspire acceptance of small visions, that's the second circle, to direct public dialogue around the big vision presented by the Weight water resource recovery upgrade. This timeline represents our reframing period and our participatory planning period on a timeline of 10 years as sort of a suggestion 
understanding that the participatory planning period, the third circle, is the most in flux and likely the longest part of this process. Small visions, again, those first two circles include concepts, the water resource recovery facility encapsulates or will later encapsulate. Starting small with the concept of the food, energy and water nexus and engineering infrastructure itself lends well to public art installations and interactive art, such as a VR experience using real time building energy consumption data, and then building upon that in the second circle with, for instance, anaerobic digestion tied to composting workshops. A highlighted case study that could fit into this timeline is an exhibit that took place at the Torpedo Factory Art Center in Northern Virginia by artist Stowe Len, which involved residents of Alexandria, Virginia, contributing to the artwork by flushing their toilets. The work he's completed is the first artist in residence at a wastewater treatment plant that is a collection of photographs, prints, and found objects. Uh, for instance, a pair of prints of brownish swirls was created by applying paper to the surface of a settling tank at the Alex Renew wastewater treatment facility. A suggestion in our deliverable for the 26th ward in this, that would fit into this first circle is a jungle bus. The transformation of a bus on a local route into a jungle complete with soil and plants. This is inspired by the what's called extreme experience creative participation tool used in the Netherlands to raise awareness among local citizens and gain social capital. A final suggestion I'm particularly fond of is a fresh food and seeds vending machine pop-up. Uh, an example of that that could be applied to that middle circle is the Gov Porch Plaza activation in the city of Charlotte. Uh, it featured design installation and activities in the Charlotte Mecklenburg Government Plaza, a space central to the downtown government district, yet rarely used by the diverse citizens who frequent the area to pay bills, attend court hearings, and utilize government services. Gov Porch sought to transform the plaza into an area where community members and government employees could interact with one another in a relaxed environment. It incorporated a range of design elements like giant wind chimes, a ping pong table and large beanbag chairs. First Friday events when the space uh, was activated with live music, interactive chalkboards, a mini library and food trucks had the greatest impact. Uh, those activities boosted confidence in local government and community pride to the tune of an increase of 23% believing that government understands community concerns, an increase of 19% believing that government is responsive to community needs and an increase of 15% proud to live in the area. A suggestion for the 26th ward might be guerrilla gardening where local municipal leaders can invite residents in the surrounding communities to plant seeds donated by perhaps East New York farms in raised beds on or adjacent to the site. Or another idea is creating, hosting a workshop where folks create an artificial reef with common household wastes like plastics. And finally, on the, in the, the, on the right side, the furthest to the right, the participatory planning process folds in on itself over time after circling through the framework in that outer circle. Evaluation should form a core part of the participation process in order to determine if the chosen method and approach were useful, if social capital was built during the process, and if the end project plan benefited from the participatory planning process. If not, the circular approach of this process means it can be repeated and lessons learned brought into repeated cycles until an isolated vision is zeroed in and agreed upon. There are many frameworks for participatory planning. There is no blueprint and there are many complexities. The reality is that participatory planning is often neglected. It takes the form of a survey or it lacks creativity and innovation. So the framework that we've proposed for this project is founded on dynamism. The process um, has an eye towards sustained engagement. And we've done this through recommending creative tools. And in addition, many of the small vision tools can be recycled here with the greater attention to place that is the, the site itself, its connection to community and the natural coastal ecosystem rather than simply the space it occupies. 
So to quickly go over that process or that framework that we're suggesting, it starts with identifying and recruiting stakeholders, um, which is as reflected in previous slides, one of the biggest barriers or hurdles. This step is particularly important though, as it sets the foundation for the quality of the process. So we've done the identification part. We have in our final deliverable, extensive list of stakeholders. Um, however, it's important to note that the entire community cannot and will never be part of the entire planning process, but adequate stakeholder and the level of stakeholder involvement should guide the planning process to be successful and comprehensive. So the next step would be taking a community snapshot um, and then getting the word out. And that includes in Spanish and English, considering the demographics of this area. Then we'd convene an initial meeting with a determined DEP leader and personally invite as many people as possible, make the meeting physically and linguistically accessible once again, hold the meeting in a safe location and provide refreshments plan activities that allow for participants to actually have their voice heard, and then come back together if we're in a large group that gets divided and clearly communicate the next steps. The next step would be to decide on an active participation level and plan activities that allow for participants to once again have their voice heard throughout the entire process. Next would be the facilitation of those public meetings, workshops, and other community engagement. And it's important here to designate a skilled DEP representative and decide if an outside facilitator is needed. Exploring the use of innovative creative tools, as we've mentioned, and community partners would also be integrated into this step. Then we'd have to decide who will issue the final approval of the upgraded plan and when. And finally, in the final step, evaluating the outcomes, evaluating the initial values as captured from steps one, two, and four um, present in the, and to see if their those values are going to be in the proposed upgrade in the final form. In this way, the evaluation phase links back to the start of the process in the appraisal, in the appraisal or community snapshot set, step. The planning participants may want to be involved throughout the construction of the upgrade, or the process may end after a number of years with the approval of the final plan. In tandem, steps to preclude gentrification, which we've touched on before, CBAs, CLTs, Community Bill of Rights should commence. And finally, engaging community members in participatory budgeting processes that help set public space priorities should round out the plan. So as we move forward and gaze into the future, we imagine water resource recovery facilities as closed loop infrastructural ecologies that incorporate synergistic frameworks, which one, close system loops to bridge the gap between food, energy, water, and community. Two, reframe concepts of waste to potentially generate revenue. And three, incorporate community driven elements that improve community health, wealth, and social resilience. Thank you. Do you wanna just narrate what we're looking at? I know it's familiar to some of us, but not to everyone. So in this rendering, we're looking at the southernmost portion of the site. And this is the eco bridge, which connects uh, the land that's way sort of in direct proximity to Jamaica Bay and um, the project elements which comprise this mega project. You can see the community resiliency center in the background, the food production center, which is sort of the urban food hub, sort of next, sort of behind that. And then you see the brewery food court, which are all sort of meant to inspire uh, the community and the pedestrian eco bridge is meant to sort of connect these nodes of the site and sort of act as Facilitated, facilitator uh, for urban agriculture practices, as you can see by the, the vegetation that's sort of dispersed throughout the site. Thank you. Great, and thank you so much, team. Um, should we kick it off with Kyle? Questions, comments? Uh, can you go back to, uh, that was very nice. I, I, 
I think I learned a lot there. Um, can you go back to your uh, um, where you were talking about your um, definition of barriers? Um, I, I'm curious. You had a lot of these barriers, and uh, also you talked about uh, this pathway uh, pathways of Let's see, let's take a look at this. Okay, uh, I think what it was, was talking about, it was after this. You had the linear pathways of uh, the various impediments. I'm just uh, wondering if you could say a few words about how you defined all of these um, and how, uh, how specific are they to the particular region you're talking about here around Jamaica Bay versus how this might be applied elsewhere. Uh, I, I think, think you got back too far. Slide, Jeremy's first uh, barrier slide. There's a lot of components in here. Uh, it's, it's a, a yeah. pretty yeah. large body of work. I'm, one, yeah. I'm curious, how long is your final report? <laughs> it's, it's well, it, it my particular portion is relatively long, and I just sort of had to cut back a little bit. But the the reasoning behind selecting these particular elements yeah. was really to be sort of general in a way that you know, if you if you're general, it gives you ways to sort of pick pieces and insert them into more specific parts of the project. So I think, you know, things like a linear mindset that could be that could be that could be put in something that has nothing to do with this project. Sure, sure. You I, know, I complete, understand completely. But I understand the components. I'm just wondering why you selected this set and how you arrived at this particular set. Because I, yeah. Uh, what was the process you used to define these? Uh, I think I read uh, Corey Johnson, who's a city council speaker, has a document and he sort of defines um, a comprehensive planning series of methods. And in that he sort of, he goes through what he considers to be sort of problems and what we should kind of think about. So I sort of extrapolated some of that and then I've sort of created my own um, regimented and sequential uh, series of, of steps. And I think it, you know, I think it's trying to be general and I think that's okay in, in some sense. So would but, you consider this adaptable to other parts of the country, for example, that would you, you know, think that the barriers you're running into here, this, these, these seven types of things you're talking about, what if you're working in Los Angeles? Uh, or Seattle or someplace like that. But I think they're applicable to the extent that the the kind of rules and regulations are sort of similar to New York in, in a way. You know, the sort of the planning, the planning methods. Um, mm -hmm. I think they they are transferable, generally speaking, yes, I do believe so. But I think there's like nuances that might prevent their application in other in other regions, like say Los Angeles. So like the like a zoning like the zoning resolution. I don't know personally if there's a zoning resolution in the city of Los Angeles, and whether or not this you know this one of these components could be transferred over to that. Yeah, so I, I would imagine your zoning situations are different, but but the general idea that you have to deal with that same kind of an issue would be, yeah would be relevant. Yeah. Um, did you have some kind? Uh, you, you talked about the. Uh, I don't know if it was before this slide, I uh, kind of lost track of what order things were in, but you talked about uh, the components, I think it was early on, the components of the system that uh, the infrastructure that would be phased in uh, <coughs> it, uh, for various reasons, you can't do it all at once. You had that discussion somewhere in here. Uh, don't. I don't know. Anyway. Um, and it's Christian's slide, I think, slide 11, conceptual. Slide 11. Oh, 
that one maybe? I don't remember the specific one, but um, you had a slide where you it talked was about that. in this context. Pardon me? Yeah, it was mentioned in this context, the context of this slide. Okay. I'm wondering, uh, did you do some kind of a, in terms of, uh, yeah, what we're doing here is is renewing infrastructure, right? So you're, uh, you have an opportunity to define the infrastructure coming in. So you phase in various components of, of this approach uh, over a particular time frame, and you have 20 years listed here. Um, did you have any kind of a, an idea for how long this particular infrastructure you're building would last until it needed a serious overhaul? What's the, did you do some kind of a, any kind of an assessment of the life cycle of this? Uh, I don't know. We didn't do that, but you have any idea? Uh, are we talking about you know this will last another fifty years before you uh, or, or we end up in the same yeah. position we're in now, where everything has to be, you know? Just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, well, this project is focused on resiliency, mm -hmm. and I imagine we want this to last at least a hundred years or more um, because as we know it now, wastewater treatment plants now, they were built what, several decades ago, 50 years, and they're still working. So uh, we kind of need, need this in type of infrastructure to still be working and functioning. So well, you would anticipate uh something that you envision something that would cover us for the next hundred year time yes okay yeah. uh, i actually can i say something i sure. i think the next phase of this project would actually be to break down the components and do a life cycle assessment of sort of each component in a way that sort of like defines the question you're asking in, in a way because i think that that's an it is an important question but given sort of the time frame that wasn't our primary goal was, you know, was to sort of like define the, the life cycle. We tried to understand the ways we could create a synergy between this infrastructure and the existing community. So I think that like moving forward, that would be, that would be really, really cool. In my yeah, I, I, I wasn't particularly looking to see that you covered it. I just wondered if you thought about it uh, and what your thoughts are, you know, <laughs> it's basically what I'm trying to get at. Um, I'll, I just I will add this is was not my area of focus in the project, um, but considering resilience also means second secondary areas of su support. It's not resilience doesn't always doesn't necessarily mean it's going to last a long time. It, it might these elements might last just as long as any other infrastructure has historically lasted, but they account for. Um, new changes in a new necessities of coastal infrastructure as climate change is impacting sea level rise and in this particular region, um, destroying the saltwater marshlands, et cetera. Destroying the saltwater marshlands? In what regard are you mentioning that? I didn't quite get that. Um, well, as the the sea level rises in the bay, yes. it's impinging on the marshland. Oh, right. Okay. All right. I see how you're. Okay. All right. Um, so you're talking about the um, coastal infrastructure threats from issues like, uh, I guess, you know, you've got sea level rise, you've got increased storm activity and stuff like that going on. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, those, those are all the general questions I had. There were a couple things that I just, uh, specifics, uh, particular questions, but I'm interested to hear what other, other folks might have to say too. So give, give somebody else a chance to ask some questions. Sure. Hillary or Michael, do you have any thoughts for your team? Well, I'm sure we can share them. I, I would like, you know, if, if anyone else listening to the presentation, um, might have some comments or queries, um, you know, before we comment on it. I think 
our team has heard a lot from both my, myself and Michael uh, as recently as this week. Um, and I probably will be reserving some comments for, um, um, you know, marking up the, the presentation. Um, I, I think, you know, if, I think just in general, I would, so let me, yeah, let me pause and see if there's any other uh, interest from um, our other participants on the call. Yeah, so I think as I was looking at uh, the estimations of costs, I can help but, you know wonder about the sort of economic benefits, um, and I'm sure that it is you know you'd have to break down each part and sort of really do a um, like a cash flow analysis and and bring into sort of social and public benefits along with things like more t uh, tangible like selling energy. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think, yeah, when I think of reasons why public or private would invest in this stuff, I think of, um, yeah, what's what's also to, to gain out of it in, in uh, economic terms. Great, great presentation, by the way. Thank you so much. Yeah, Jay, I think that's I think that's really astute, and it it really does sort of suggest a series of next steps. I think that you know the team as they've um, as, as they've struggled to you know grasp uh, the magnitude of the project, the complexity, the, the multi-headedness of the teams of the of the actors involved um, have made certain assumptions. We, we all make certain assumptions about you know what are the co-benefits from um, you know, the restaurant and the brewery um, affixed to a wastewater treatment plant. And so, uh, you know, and as well as the urban ag, I mean, it, it, it makes sense to us because we've been thinking about the proximity and the, the food, water, energy nexus for a long time. But, you know, a further um, listing of, of the benefits would be kind of part of a next um, step in terms of selling this um, to uh, the DEP and the other agencies so that it's really clear, you know, why the complexity and why this hybra, hydra headed um, or hybrid facility makes a lot of sense. Um, not necessarily a question, but more so a comment. Um, I just wanted to appreciate the, as as you said, Hillary, just the magnitude of the project they were working on. Um, most departments have like multiple different agency offices with multiple teams of like teams of engineers and landscape architects and, and like designers and scientists all working on things that just have as many moving parts as what, as what we're seeing in this presentation. Um, so that's, it's pretty impressive, and I wanted to to commend the team for that. Yeah, thanks. And you have something of a of an insider's understanding of the complexity of the the bureaucracy and the planning process. Um, yeah, no, I'm I I have to say I think that um, we have um, you've dimensioned the problem. I think you've you've done the presentation in a very colorful and vivid way. Um, I think the graphics are strong. I, I am just going to mention, because I think this is, a, I'm going to make a general comment, not necessarily um, directed at anyone, but there is, you know, the, uh, the trap that we often fall into in preparing a presentation and a paper kind of in, uh, in sync. And that is, that we, we, we find that, you know, we really like what we've written, we have to say it all, and we have to sort of uh, get that narrative across sometimes with only one slide on the screen. So it, it creates a kind of a disconnect for the audience between what we're looking at visually and what we're hearing. 
Um, you know, so Sabrina, for example, with some of your uh, slides about the, the community engagement and opposition, you know, you, you had a lot of uh, verbal description. And I think it would have, um, frankly, would have been very helpful to have added some slides that uh, we could then track. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going back a couple of slides, I think. Yeah, I think these, these you know, were uh, on the screen for like two minutes or three minutes, and um, they were, you know, great uh, bullets to capture the essence of what you're saying. But um, then you went on to much more um, uh, robust descriptions, and it became a little bit of a disconnect between what we were trying to understand and the visuals. And this is a trap with, with many presentations that I've seen. So I'm making a point of it in a generic way. I knew you would say that, Hillary. So it's fine. All right. I just said, I knew you would say that. So it's uh, fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that it's very hard once you've written the script to then you know, connect it to the, the visual information which probably preceded it. Yeah, yeah. Without yeah. I got a little lost there. Of feedback, self-critical yeah. self feedback. Yeah, I, I, I did. I also got a little lost in all the words that were said to some slides that had seemingly few points on them, yeah. but you went a lot into detail on particular points and spent a lot of time on them. It, it would have helped follow the visual a little bit if, if those were expanded on them. Yeah. I have a specific question for Christian and then a, a broader question for Jeremy, I think. Um, so Christian, just um, detail, um, you know, your cost estimates are based on, on uh, comparables on case studies that you looked at, you, you showed a partial table of them. About how many case studies, and just approximately all told across all your sectors, about how many case studies did you look at um, and find you know costs for? So I think it was ten per component. So, hmm. uh, so what have you got here? Ten component. The components are down on the left of this slide, right, or the column on the uh, left? Uh, the first column. Here. Hold on. So each of these circles is a component. Yeah. 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 So, so, so you looked at something on the order of a hundred case studies. Yeah. About. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's great. Thank you. And Jeremy, you know, I, you articulated very well, you know, coming out of Christian's point about the, 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 the mega project, the huge dollar value, you know, the, you articulated the issue that Lisa, Leah just uh, referred to, you know, of how complicated the agency structure is and, and you know how convoluted it can be to coordinate anything across agencies. Um, so, but I, I'm not sure I heard any any kind of solution pathway to that you know very basic problem. I mean, a lot of times mega projects are associated with a, an authority, you know, a very firm kind of structure that that spans agency lines or some kind of coordination mechanism. I, I didn't didn't come through to me clearly where that would be, and it's it seems to me such a key issue. Yeah, I, comment I on agree. That? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I could have been more. Uh, I could have explored the strategies in depth more in the presentation for sure, but I didn't want to get like bogged down by each you know, individual sort of, you know, strategy, because they're mm -hmm. they are dense, and they're fairly complex. And I feel as though yeah. that's something that could happen um, in another presentation where we isolate that one thing and sort of then go into, you know, each strategy, because it, it is, it's probably one of the larger topics of the pathways and barriers to explore. But it's also really dense. And I felt as though it might not have had a place in this presentation, just because of it. It's so deep, it's deep. It's, it's a deep dive. It's deep and it's complicated, but that's why politicians like authorities because they can sit, they can by yeah. fiat say, you know, cut through all of the difficulties by saying, okay, 
this is how it's done. This is how it's going to go. And, and then the authority has the authority to, to cut through all the stuff. So anyway, yeah. okay. I agree. I agree. With, I agree with you. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, understanding the complexity of the New York City planning process, plus the, you know, what the agency jurisdictions are and how siloed they are, it, it does, you know, it does sort of beg for a larger, um, uh, I guess authority is the word, you know, it could be a, some, some kind of a, a special district yeah. uh, or something designated at the state level. Um, mm -hmm. there, there probably are formulas for that, that we, we uh, I don't think guided you uh, to, but I think your descriptions of, of these as barriers, I think is very apt. And, and so we still struggle on for solution. You know, I think, I think this will be extremely useful for DEP um, to, to have, and um, we will probably try to share the recording with them. And, you know, it, mi it might spark some, some deeper questions uh, for them uh, about, you know, what, what is the capacity of their agency and how limited they are uh, in being able to move a heavy lift such as this. And so where would they go? Um, who could they bring in? Those types of questions. Uh, Leah, you had some other comment or? Yeah, I was just, uh, you guys are talking about interagency coordination, and I feel like that could be a whole capstone project in itself. Um, yeah. And that if, you know, in this presentation, you were able to like crack the code of like how agencies could finally communicate with one another in an efficient and non-redundant way, um, then, well, I guess that's redundant to say as well, but, uh, but you know, then, municipalities throughout not just America, but the whole world would be far more streamlined and have their stuff figured out. Um, so that's that's something that I'm constantly struggling with, especially at work. <laughs> yeah, for those who know of us who know it from the inside, it's it it's a monster. So yeah, I want I want to thank the group and uh, my co-mentor on this, Michael, um, uh, you well know, done, it's an exploration. And um, I, I hope that it's been as rich for you intellectually as, as it's been for us. Yeah, Thank it was you. a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was really great. Thank you so much, Hillary, Michael, and the team. Um, like others have said, a really fantastic, clear presentation that involved a lot of really complex content. And with that, uh, we're ready to move on to our next team, unless there are any concluding thoughts on this project, burning questions. Okay, then we'll hear from our resilient CLT capstone. Thank you so much again. Great, thank you so much. Um, I feel as though this is a really wonderful transition to our project because some of the elements that were mentioned in the first presentation, such as community resiliency, um, you know, community land trust, were all things that we focused on specifically in, in our capstone. Um, so without further ado, uh, hopefully, is everyone able to see the, the top slide yes. that I have? Okay, great. Um, so good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending tonight's presentation with our capstone group. Uh, my name is Leah Heinches. I'm accompanied by my colleagues, Chelsea and Kababian, Kathy Kashko, and Jay Wu. And our supervisor is Catherine Glody Silverman. The title of our capstone project is Think Beyond Crisis, Community Land Trust for the Future of Resilience. Um, tonight's presentation is gonna be divided into four categories. The first is gonna be pr the background presented by Jay Wu. Next will be procedure presented by myself. The next will be the results from Chelsea. And finally, the conclusions with Kathy. So with that, thank you so much and take it away, Jay. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Leah. Um, so the central research question for a capstone was how can community land trusts adapt to climate change while improving their economic resilience? 
And community land trusts or CLTs are democratically controlled nonprofit entities that get dedicated to providing permanent affordability. Uh, given that the opportunities for CLTs are highly dependent on local policy context, we wanted to bound our study geographically so that it was specific enough to directly benefit existing community land trusts. For that reason, we picked our home state of New York. As we performed our background research, it became clear that there are very few community land trusts today in the entire United States, let alone New York, that are focused on climate resilience. But there's a growing interest in this space. So to help close this gap, we studied and interviewed organizations that operate under a community ownership model or provide consultative services to organizations with that model, but few were community land trusts themselves. Next slide, please. So most definitions of climate resilience describe an ability to prepare for, absorb, recover, and adapt to ha hazardous climate events. But to understand what makes a community resilient, we have to drill in into three elements of resilience as ran by Steven Tyler and Marcus Munch. Physical systems refers to infrastructure that brings us water, energy, food, transportation. Agents are the people and organizations who use or manage those systems. And institutions are the laws and customs governing those agents' interactions and decision-making. Next slide. For each of these elements, certain qualities lend themselves to climate resilience. Resilient physical systems are distributed and networked. Resilient agents are resourceful and responsive. Resilient institutions are participatory and inclusive. And these are all relevant for community land trusts, as we'll see. Uh, next slide. So, when it comes to economic resilience, I want to hone in here because it is a, a particular facet of institutional resilience, as mentioned before. Um, in particular, if we're going to, in modern society, we can't speak of institutions without speaking of economics because so many interactions that we have today are mediated through currency and capital. So much of what we need to survive and enjoy a decent quality of life is dependent on purchasing power. And the same falls for climate vulnerability. Whether you can afford to own land and housing, where you can afford to buy a home has a huge impact on your climate vulnerability. And notably historic urban policies and behavior have disadvantaged communities of color disproportionately, creating a significant racial economic gap. And that's what actually prompted the invention and development of community land trusts in the 1970s. Next slide. During the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King's cousin, Slater King, an activist, Robert Swan, conceived the community land trust model. They defined community land trusts as democratically controlled nonprofit entities dedicated to providing permanent affordability. Um, and CLTs separate the land from the housing built on top of the land, which allows housing to be bought at cheaper prices. The CLT's board usually consists of elected appointees, some of which are CLT residents, others are community residents, and others are public representatives. And it's worth noting this democratic community ownership means that a group of people collectively possess the benefits and risks associated with the assets, and that they vote on leadership and important decisions. There's a direct through line here to the socioeconomic aspects of resilience mentioned earlier. The people most climate vulnerable have a voice in planning for climate change and have the resources to act on those plans. And next slide. Uh, from here on, we're gonna move on to the, our procedure for this project and I'll hand it off to Leah. Great, thanks so much for that good introduction, Jay. Um, the next section is the procedure. Uh, so an important component of our project was process development. For our project, we compiled a list of 21 community-focused resiliency groups, including eight CLTs. We reached out to all of them via cold calling, emailing, and social media contacting using templates that the group developed together. In each of these outreach efforts, we included invitations for candidates to take short web form surveys, as well inviting them to a long sit-down interview. 
The short web form survey included a select all that apply multiple choice option, as well as open answer options. Each of these questions covered one of eight topics that I'll go into in the next slide. Ultimately, we sought to distill all the collected information or the into a deliverable or the executive report, which is essentially a summarized version of our final paper. And for this next slide, each of our surveys and sit down interviews had a structure of eight types of questions. The first is asking the interviewee what the structure of their project and organization was. The next is their views on economic resilience. And then after that would be, oops, just kidding. <laughs> and then after that would be how the project organization earned money, how they saved money, and as well as the government relationships and partnerships that that organization formed. Um, and then after that was the social and economic community benefits of their project organization. And then the last two would be recommendations that the, these interviewees would have for CLTs or community focused resiliency groups, um, recommendations in terms of how new ones could get started or what recommendations they would have for existing ones to improve their options for success. And then finally, we had invitation questions. So for every sit down interview we had, we would invite them to do the web form survey because it could capture information that we didn't get during the interview. And likewise, the, the, the web form survey could offer the opportunity for interviewees to expand on anything that they would like to in a sit down interview setting. So for this next section, um, we would like to clarify that these are not CLTs that we interviewed, but projects and organizations that work to improve community conditions. While our, trouble while our group had trouble connecting directly with CLTs, we were able to secure interviews with these groups that we felt could strengthen CLT success. Um, Kathy will go into further description on some of our outreach challenges in the conclusion section. But the first interview was Project Abigail. This is a family owned consulting nonprofit that was originated in the Bronx. And we chose to speak with them because they help develop CLTs. They promote long-term neighborhood planning. They offer guidance and frameworks for long-term success for communities. The next one was Divas for Social Justice, Garden of Resilience. This is a community garden owned by nonprofit Diva for Social Justice in Laurelton, New York. And they owned and created and host an after school STEAM youth program, which is the same thing as STEM, except it includes the arts. Um, we chose to speak with them because they work to make food, education, and green space available to the community. The next one was Community Power, Solar One, which was actually referenced in the previous presentation, which we thought was pretty cool. Um, so, Community Power, so Solar One, is essentially an environmental education nonprofit. Um, they educate schools, homeowners, and community groups, and they offer technical assistance for solar installation processes. We spoke, we decided to speak with them because they seek to improve resiliency and sustainability without sacrificing affordability, which is something that CLTs could really use. The next one was UHAB, so that stands for Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, um, specifically titled Clean Heat for Go-Ops. This is a non nonprofit advising groups for rent controlled housing tenants and we chose to speak with them because they seek to expand access to renewable sources of energy for improved home costs, as well as heat pump efficiency, which would also improve housing costs and heating efficiency. And next is going to be Chelsea, who will take it away with the results of these interviews. Thank you, Leah. So in this section, I'll be reviewing a snapshot of our results from both our survey and our interviews. And in today's results section, we'll be reviewing the featured question themes that Leah had mentioned in the previous slides. And those themes, themes include social and economic benefits, how the project slash organization earned and saved their money, uh, barriers they faced, and recommendations for CLTs. Next slide, please. So it was important for our team to ask our interviewees about the relationship that they had to the community that they worked in. So in this slide, we asked respondents to share what they think their program's economic value is to the community. We provided some options for answers such as provide financial literacy programming, uh, lower the cost of living, et cetera. 
Uh, we also allowed for space for respondents to input their own answers that we had not thought of when we were creating the survey. What we found was most of our respondents believed that their greatest economic value to the community was providing both jobs and professional development opportunities. And both of those results answered, um, received five responses each. Next slide, please. Additionally, we asked the respondents to share what they thought their program's social value was to the community. We provided options for responses such as improving housing conditions, um, bridging the, the digital divide, et cetera. And the majority of our survey takers, six out of seven responded in their social benefit to the community was their work allowed for increased sense of belonging and camaraderie. Next slide. Then we asked questions specific to their organization's economic standings. We wanted to get a better understanding uh, how economically resilient the respondents felt. So in this slide, we asked how uh, respondents reduced their operational expenses. And we provided potential answers such as earned tax credits, tax rebates, et cetera. And we found that three out of five responses, uh, which was the majority said that they reduced operational costs by qualifying for tax deductions. Something to note with this particular question, uh, which we found interesting was that this question received the least amount of feedback. So you'll see two out of seven survey takers chose not to answer this question at all. So this led us to question the setup or the way we framed this question. Um, some ideas we had as to why we had less responses um, were two, kind, two sort of thoughts. Uh, one was that it would, could have been the framing of the question that folks felt they were uncomfortable with answering that question. Um, and another thought that um, came to, to our mind as well was, uh, the folks that we were asking to be these respondents might not have been privy to this information. Next slide. So in this question, we asked how these organizations and projects earn their revenue. So we wanted to get a better understanding where their resources came from and how that could be relevant to CLTs. So we offered response options such as selling products, individual donations, subscriptions, etc. And we found that as a, the majority of our respondents rely on partnerships to finance um, their work. So we can see here that the highest responses fall under obtaining both government grants and foundational grants. Next slide. So in this graph, uh, it looks a little bit different than the others. This is extrapolated information from the open-ended responses for both the surveys and the interviews. And we looked to find trends with both. So we added open-ended questions and answer sections in the survey to allow for unexpected answers to arise. And interestingly enough, uh, we saw trend, trends in these responses from both the survey and the interview, uh, which I'll be sharing in this and the next three slides. Um, you'll see in this slide, uh, we inquired about the barriers faced by organizations and projects. And you'll see that the responses varied, but across all respondent types, the unanimous barrier faced was the administrative process. So all five, five out of five respondent types mentioned this as their biggest barrier. Additionally, four out of five respondent responses saw that permitting was a big barrier to the work. Next slide, please. We also wanted to get insights on where these barriers could be improved to best facilitate the work of these organizations and, and projects. So we asked respondents for their ideas for improvement. And we found that the recommendations often tied with the previous question about their barriers. Uh, and so the highest responses regarding improvement centered around financial opportunities. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, the last result we're gonna showcase today uh, were the recommendations our respondents had for economic resilience and success. So we asked respondents to give advice to CLTs that they wish they would have known when they first started the work in order to achieve economic resiliency. Um, we also framed this question about strategies and best practices. Uh, the top, what we noticed was the top three recommendations that our interviewees and surveys um, responded to were strengthening partnerships and government funding, uh, getting involved in policy and advocacy work, and increasing opportunities for community and youth employment. So out of these top uh, recommendation trends, 
our team was most surprised by the re recommendations for CLTs to get involved in the political process and advocacy work. So some direct thoughts from these surveys and interviews included um, recommending that CLTs align with legislation that would benefit their mission, uh, building relationships with local politicians, and also for CLT members to run for local office themselves so that um, folks who are in positions of power better reflect their community. So now we're going to move on to the conclusion section where Kathy will go into further detail about our interpretation of the results. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Chelsea. We will now discuss the key takeaways and findings from our research, limitations, our deliverable and recommended future projects. Next slide, please. Going back to our, our central question, our project objective was to study how New York City CLTs can adapt to climate change while improving their economic resilience. After reviewing our results, one of the major takeaways from our research is that CLTs have limited resources to invest in climate change and economic resiliency. Because of this, they're not self-reliant, but rather need to engage in partnerships. For example, you have partners with NYSERDA, New York State and Energy Research Development, who then partners with Con Edison. This partnership is what fund their programs such as Clean Heat for Co-ops. Another example of a creative partnership is uh, Garden of Resilience, part as they partner with New York City Parks Department. The founder, Clarissa, explained that she found them helpful as they provided their soil, garden beds, and seeds. Another takeaway was the need for political engagement, as it would play a critical role in removing barriers. For starters, permitting guidelines need to be clear and transparent. As Project Abigail shared, it can be difficult and challenging just reading and interpreting municipal code in New York City. Removing a barrier such would make it easier for CLTs to just start. To add on, Community Solar also expressed the hassle for installing solar arrays and batteries as they need to comply to both FDNY and DOB codes. Having cohesive permitting guidelines across agencies would make it easier for CLTs to switch to sustainable alternatives when adapting to climate change. In addition, having access to capital would help CLTs when starting up and sustaining themselves. Clean Heat for Co-ops explained the need for initial capital when electrifying heating systems, as the cost up front would be super high, but in the long run, they would be energy cost savings. Lastly, there's a barrier for local workforce and leadership development opportunities. We found that through political engagement, power, and partnerships, these barriers can significantly be reduced. Next slide, please. <clears throat> There were two major limitations our research project faced. One was the lack of previous studies in this research area. In terms of the research topic, CLTs are either too new or too small to provide substantial data and resources. This made it hard for us to find and review literature and case studies on CLTs. There were few, but not a large significant amount available. Another limitation we faced was bandwidth limitation. We had difficulty reaching and getting in touch with multiple CLTs and organizations, especially due to COVID whether this was due to short staff, staff shortage or availability. Nevertheless, we were able to interview four different organizations and retrieve service responses from seven others. Next slide, please. As a result of our research, we have created an executive report as a deliverable, which holds a collection of suggestions and recommendations for existing and prospective CLTs and government agencies. These recommendations are based on the interviews, survey responses, and our background research. The recommendations in the deliverable will include leveraging your expertise, expand partnerships and funders, increase policy and advocacy work, open up access of green spaces, community and youth employment, community communications, provide professional development, and lastly, green technology. Our hope for this deliverable is to provide CLTs with potential solutions and ideas on how to achieve economic and climate change resiliency. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Future projects we, we suggest would be first and foremost to continue developing case studies on CLTs in order to further understand any challenges faced, achievements, and successful models. Another project we suggest is looking into insurance uh, cost impacts on CLT success. Insurance cost is an additional expense, especially for CLTs, which may lead to the decision of opting out. However, with the rise of natural disasters, it may be worth investing in insurance. We would be interested to see how this added cost affects CLT success. Lastly, another future project we'd recommend is to study COVID-19 impacts on CLTs. Next slide. Thank you all so much for listening.
Thank you for your presentation, team. Um, to kick things off, Hillary, do you have questions, comments? Oh. No, I think that was a really interesting presentation um, and, and uh, well-guided research, I think, you know, within the limitations of the numbers of uh, CLTs you could access and using other kinds of similar institutions as proxies, I think was a great strategy. Um, and I think you kind of answered one of my questions in terms of um, the, the final executive report that you will be sharing this presumably back with the organizations that you interviewed, uh, but hopefully you can reach an audience uh, beyond the, the New York City area, right? That's your intention. Yes, we're actually working with HBD. So our hope is also to use this executive report and have HBD present this to the CLTs that they work with. Mm -hmm. And um, our, our um, mentor from HBD, Lita, she also suggested that we do a presentation uh, for her associates. Um, it would be great if we could present this to folks beyond New York State. Absolutely. And, and you know, just one of the questions that I would have, you know, we're talking about vulnerability, resilience, um, and, and ways uh, that, that CLTs can, can benefit from the, the model, um, the, you know, the structure of ownership. Um, do you, you know, have there been CLTs that have been exposed uh, to, you know, climate uh, vulnerabilities or, you know, disaster zones? Um, and if so, you know, how, how did they perform? Um, and I'm, it was kind of a, a, a question directed at, um, you know, insurance. Do they have, uh, are there advantages to having uh, the kind of ownership um, structure? So I'm not sure about in regards to insurance, but sort of the most, um, the case that came up most striking for, for in our background research was actually in Puerto Rico, yeah. the Caño Martin Peña um, mm -hmm. CLT. And um, it's a pretty interesting story because there is essentially um, like restorative uh, uh, efforts going on in, in that sort of ecology. Mm -hmm. um, but the people there were saying that restoration, um, while it will benefit this area, it might raise prices to and essentially kick us out, right? So how are we gonna receive the benefits if, if we can't afford to live here? Mm. Um, and uh, so I think that was the sort of, um, I think that's what we imagine we're gonna see in this, in, mm. in you know, uh, this part of the country as well. Um, when it comes to flood insurance specifically, I'm not sure, but I think ultimately the way I think about it is like, these are almost like an alternative um, like township model, right? Where, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, it's much less sort of profit driven and, and more, uh, um, yeah, fo where funds are really directed towards social benefits. Yeah. 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 To, to kind of add to what Jay was saying, um, it could be really interesting to know some of the impacts directly directly correlated with the insurance component and the resiliency components. Um, we have a number of CLTs that are in New York City, many of which were impacted by Tropical Storm Ida that came through a couple months ago, some of which were probably impacted really heavily, like Nos Um, And it would be wonderful to talk to them post fact, like when they've finally recovered to see what is the hindsight 2020 of that situation. Do you wish that you had had flood insurance for that situation? <laughs> Hopefully they already did because I'm sure the damage was extensive. Um, that was one of the reasons why we had so much trouble contacting CLTs during this time is because a lot of their efforts are about housing of their residents and 
right when we were doing our outreach is when all the tropical storms hit the area. So of course it, it impacted our, our con- able, ability to connect with some of these people, but it would be really wonderful to talk to some of these, these community land trusts after the fact to be what would, were your takeaways <laughs> from that experience? That could be a follow on capstone. You know, right. have, we're going to have an endless series of, you know, these kinds of um, untoward events. So it would be good to really harvest some of the responses. Right. And and to add on, just to say that there isn't that much like case studies done. Uh, there were three that we focused on because, and there were so such a limited amount, like it was just, um, DNI, uh, Durham, um, community land trustees, and Chaplain. Like these are the only ones that we really had any case studies available in any literature review. So um, yeah, it'd be great to have more of that available, just to you know p- provide that information to other prospective CLTs who are interested in starting up. Just providing that um, information as well. I mean, it would be interesting to find out, you know, say in in the Delta region, you know. Right. The Delta are are there organizations that have um, sustained uh, themselves, you know, through inundation, and you know how how did the CLT model advantage them? Yeah, that, that would be a really great capstone project. <laughs> Follow up one for this one. I have yeah, a question about been... what you might have found about costs of. What are the areas of costs for starting a CLT? So, you know, I'm particularly interested in the the anti-gentrification idea of using the the CLT. And I I just wonder how a group would initiate um, the the process where they felt that, you know, there were going to be improvements in an area and and um, you know they wanted to protect their rights. What? How would how would that look in terms of process and costs they might incur? Would they, do they have to do they have to purchase land from someone or? Yeah. So this is a good question, and we it was purposefully out of scope for our project because um, because it's it's its whole own question. Uh, but we we did learn a bit about it, and I think Kathy stumbled upon a really interesting case study where like uh, use of eminent do- domain was used for uh, for procuring land. That was one case though. Um, often you, they the just only. have to purchase it, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, for Dudley, they're the only one that used the eminent domain. And so the government um, provided that land for them to use a Dudley Triangle. Um, and so that was the only CLT that was able to, you know, get that land through government, uh, through the eminent domain, where the government um, gets the land and then provides it for a nonprofit um, for the community use, basically. Um, and so that was a one case so far, and and something that you know they have advocated. It's like you should advocate for this to be used in other CLTs. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add something else, Jay. Yeah, there was a concept that we didn't really get a chance to touch on uh, of like public land banks, which I which I would understand as like the you know city or state owning a piece of land that they can sort of be able to to um, I don't I offer for for a cheaper price than I imagine otherwise, but I, we didn't really get into it as much as we would have liked to. I'd say. Yeah, of course, that's how that's how you have started was in city-owned properties taking, supporting homesteading groups in city-owned properties. But, you know, interestingly, they, the city didn't, didn't go to a, uh, they went to a 99-year lease, mm. um, not to a land trust model. So, mm. and, and 99 years sounded like a long time, but, you know, that was in the 1980s. So it's halfway through now. I don't know that, yes. <laughs> the, land, um, the land component, the land banking or, or a procuring land is was one of the major startup issues from some of the, we, we read a couple of the, the flagship or capstone um, papers that one of the three essentially that exist about capstone, about CLTs. Um, the one by Jessica Granis called, I think it's community land equals community trust or 
resiliency. Um, and in the beginning of that paper, she says one of the number one issues for CLT to get started is to obtain that land because the nonprofit organization, which is composed of people in the neighborhood or you know locals, they don't necessarily have that capital to compete with private developers to buy that land to begin with and then to right. begin the development process. Um, so that's one of the major issues. But I do believe that there was land, there was money and funds allocated by New York State within the past five to 10 years that is intended to be the seed funds for community land trusts. Um, it's like a grant program that goes specifically to CLTs to help have more of a competitive advantage for that seed fund money um, for procuring land. But um, obviously a grant can only go so far. Um, and it, that only helps with part of the cost, but that was one of the things that uh, we thought about. So I, I have a, a so if a group that was in a climate challenged, if a group that was in a climate challenged area, um, you know, where their where their homes had been damaged and you know they'd had one event already, um, would you recommend that they land trust their try and land trust their land to protect themselves or should they should they you know like be trying to land trust some land in Ohio or something that leads to an interesting topic of managed retreat so I guess it depends on whether or not um, if they were to consult perhaps like zoning or climate change people or or whatever the projections the hundred year projections the 400 year projections potentially where the sea levels are going to be and what the storm situation might be further along down the road. But, um, you know, that's that's a really interesting question that a lot of communities are currently tackling. Um, and that's what many people in New York City are probably thinking about as they're being flooded from Sandy and then flooded from Ida a couple months ago, um, you know, from which people have lost their lives. And that that does bring a great question. Should someone be rebuilding or should they be seeking elsewhere? Um, and for me personally, I feel as though if it would probably be wiser to seek safer land further inland or uphill somewhere. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know if anyone else on my team has uh, have thoughts or feelings about that question. And, and I realize that question is way out of scope. So thank you for that answer. I, I um, want to add on to that. I just want to add on to that that um, the precipice of the of our paper and our research question came from uh, our literature review and our relationship with HBD, where um, it was shared to us that a lot of the current CLTs that will be facing climate challenges are facing these barriers of, of cost and, and how they can sustain being a CLT um, when finances are is a really big issue. So that's where our study and our research into these interviews came along, which, which was to try and provide some support and to provide some options for current CLTs or maybe even new CLTs to think a little bit outside of the box um, to how to become economically resilient with these different strategies and tools that we've, we've gotten from our interviews and surveys. Just to add a tiny bit of HPD context, that's uh, the project also kind of came out of the Resilient Edgemere project, which is a CLT in Edgemere, Queens, which is part of the Rockaways. Um, and it did form, my understanding is it formed after Sandy, so a place that is very much in a climate vulnerable state and might someday be a candidate for managed retreat uh, they decided to stay and instead create affordability and uh, a resiliency model through CLTs. Yeah. Um, and an important point, sorry to, oh, sorry. Is it okay if I add one more thing, Hillary? Please, please. Okay, um, something that is worth mentioning is that you can dramatically increase the resiliency of a plot of land if you add certain protection features, um, either various bioswales or you know, various exposures to add, you know, you know, like Stills. permeable surfaces. Yeah, you know, pretty, like something that could add additional action. So that's that's something that CLTs could and very well should consider um, for the future resiliency of their of their land if they're not in a directly vulnerable location. And could be a topic for a future capstone project as well. Yeah, I. <laughs> 
Well, just coincidentally, my, my most recent interest area is in managed retreat. And I hadn't been thinking along lines of CLTs as a very interesting mechanism. So I may wish to be in touch with one of you. Um, but I have a rather naive question to ask about CLTs, which really reflects my ignorance. Um, so the idea of affordability, um, when a home, somebody's you know, leased in or bought in, and then they, um, they wish to, to sell, and obviously uh, the trust keeps a portion of the value of that asset, correct? Um, and, and so my question is, is does, does the CLT sort of reduce the um, opportunity for people to build equity um, at all? I mean, has, has that ever come up as, as part of a discussion question? Does that yeah. make sense? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, the answer is yes. I think ultimately, like, um, there are caps on the the sort of amount of speculation that, or like, yeah. right, the, the amount that you can um, sell the That's housing right. for. Um, and, and one thing to sort of note is just sort of, they're only, well, actually, there, there are a few different ways it plays out. Often with these ground leases, right, you, um, you only sort of own the, the, the building part of it. And it's still technically under what is a, called a ground lease. It's a long-term um, mm -hmm. lease. Um, yeah. The lease of the property, the lease of the land. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the land of the CLT that's yeah. being leased. And then the property, the, the structure itself will be owned. Um, but there is, because a portion of the resale is sent back to the COT itself, mm -hmm. um, there, there is like, I guess like a cap or a limit to it of how much um, the homeowner will walk away. Um, it's not going to be a large amount. Uh, right. And so that's something that, you know, community, like uh, those within the community have to be aware is like, okay, you are, you know, part of the CLT, but be aware that a part, portion of that will be going back to the CLT, you know, sustaining you. You will get some, um, you will get some gains back from it. You will right. get something back from it. And, and it's helping you overall, but it's not going to be like you, a, a large asset that you'll get. Um, and so that's a part of like one of the um, criticism is that community, the, the people in the community forget that it's about the community itself. You know, it's not an individual interest. It's yeah. about how am I helping the community overall? Absolutely. That was one of the criticisms that did, did come up um, that sometimes that's kind of forgotten about. Yeah, so you have to intentionally, you know, you're electively, uh, entering into this, you know, communal, this common, right. if you mm -hmm. will, um, and you forfeit, you know, some of your wealth building. Yeah, right. but there's also, um, in, in Burlington, they have studies on this about how it often, we're talking about folks who wouldn't afford sort of exactly a, a home ownership mm -hmm. through sort of the conventional means. So you're yes. still being put in a more stable position to have make savings yeah. and earn credit. And so people end up, this ends up being sort of a, uh, yeah, a, a situation to, to, to enter the market, enter the market. Right. Later. And exactly. then that's happened. There's studies about it. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. No, oh, thank you for enlightening me. Kyle, uh, questions, comments? You know, <clears throat> um, what I'm, I'm kind of a process oriented person. I'm kind of interested in how you designed all of these questions because you, so much of your research here, it was all based on these um, surveys. How did you do the mapping when you designed the questions to what you wanted to interpret as your, uh, you know, your findings related to, to the future uh, of these CLTs related to climate. Um, did you have a process that you followed in designing the the, the queries that you made? Um, 
Um, I guess. I, is it a defined start. process? I, I don't know. I've never really designed a survey like this. I'm just wondering how that works. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because none of us have like uh, like communications backgrounds. You know, we all come from either in engineering or um, you know various other various other backgrounds. That's what I am. I'm an engineer, and <laughs> you know, I'm interested in traceability through systems. So you're asking yourself, you know, I want to design a system with these features, and how do I have to fix these features and, the, and they're related to the inputs you can measure yeah. or something. And I assume that there's some kind of a process related to designing, um, uh, you know, uh, surveys that might be similar to that. Uh, is there? So, so my girlfriend and partner um, is like a user researcher for a living and does, does surveys for uh, like a, a company called Etsy. And I think uh, one, Surveys are necessarily sort of, um, you know, less accurate than other types of data collection sometimes, be, um, but there are ways to sort of word questions and, and test them with people to just sort of make sure that, like ultimately, often what you experience is what people say in a survey in a moment isn't always, perfectly reflective of um, of their experience. And so I think in a in a like an ideal situation, you have some sort of other data to uh, to sort of compare it to and and sort of correlate. Uh, but yeah, I think for for us, it was really about what are we trying to understand about these, these projects uh, that will that could be of benefit and really sort of spark some thinking for for existing community land trusts. Yeah, I thought yeah. your your questions were well poised, actually, and I was, I was kind of impressed about that. That's that's what uh, what you know. But when you started out, um, you know, I, I thought the surveys were going to be part of that. I thought you were going to have other data coming in later, but uh, that that might do this, but I was I was impressed you uh, uh, had these well designed sort of queries that that allowed you to to study this. I thought that was a very interesting approach, and I just uh, to think about how that worked out for you. So, I mean, did you think about other data or as well as the surveys so much, or did you just decide to go from that from the start? Uh, we originally, well, we started off with the survey based off of the time frame that we had. So we were conducting these surveys and interviews over summer break. So um, something also to note is just like the time frame that we had. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thought using the survey would be the most effective way to utilize our time um, so that we could complete the project. Cause I'm sure we could have continued research for a lot longer than we did. Um, the original, we originally thought of widening our scope by tapping into CLTs, um, like list forms for CLTs all over the US, but then it created a little bit of complications with our scope of, of our question. Um, but the way that we uh, formulated it that I thought was kind of the open-ended portions of our, of our surveys and interviews allowed for a lot more um, creative thinking, especially because we are all new to learning about CLTs. None of us are really like, this is not our profession. So we had one semester to really deeply dive into it. Um, and then the open-ended portions of those surveys and interviews allowed for a lot more creativity and thinking that we did not expect. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that we, as the team formulated, like Jay said, we formulated these questions upon my, like a few iterations actually. And it really came down to um, not only what we thought would be uh, valuable for CLTs, but the feedback that we were getting from our um, HBD representative and um, the suggestions that they made for what they thought would be helpful for CLTs as well, since they have a lot more experience working with them. This is such an emergent um, sort of area of interest, right? There, In the last maybe like five years in New York, there's been 
you know, gone from one or two to, to you know, five to, to 10 mm. like, prospective sales he's. And so there isn't really much public data out there to, to work with, at least in, in regards to community land trust in particular. Um, I think it'd be really great to have, I think maybe we sh it should have been in the future recommendations to have sort of big public data sets um, that, that have sort of quantitative, uh, yeah, that, that help us understand what community land trusts are from a quantitative standpoint. But we were only, because of what's out there and, and you know, the context, we were really only able to do a qualitative study. I appreciate that answer. Thanks. Michael, I think I saw you had your hand up. No, not actually. I was going to say interesting, really interesting project, and I, I'm going to have to sign off. So. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you so much you know, for joining and for your feedback. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else questions, comments from the audience? No, it's <laughs> Friday night at almost 9 p.m. Got it. Okay. <laughs> well, if there are no other thoughts, um, just to conclude, thank you so much to both of the teams for really clear and really excellent presentations. Um, congratulations on completing this milestone in the program. And for those of you who are graduating, especially if you were full-time students over the last three semesters, congratulations on graduating almost entirely online, if not entirely online. Um, you would be, and hopefully are our first and only cohort to do so. Um, so really congratulations everyone on, on completing these projects in such a difficult landscape. Um, really great work. Yeah. and and. Thanks to you, Catherine, for shepherding not only this one, but a host of others at the same time. So um, yeah, great work, everybody. And now on to the paper, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, hopefully something's written down, but yeah, it's up to your mentors when you submit that, um, since grades aren't due technically until the 28th. Yeah. Um, and just a quick housekeeping item. So your grades from the first semester that just read satisfactory performance will be changed to whatever letter grade you receive for the second semester. Any other concluding thoughts before we end? No, Thank well you so much. Thanks. Okay. So much. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy yeah. New Year. To you. Congratulations again, and thank you so much for your presentations and your feedback. Yep. Thank you. Happy thank holidays, you. everyone. Thank you. Good night and good luck. <laughs>